Welcome to Joy for the Journey, a worship service television ministry presented by your friends at the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist, and we had a really, really great week at VBS. So, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about what we did, and the kids are going to share some scripture with you. So, day one, we learned all about creation. And our pal for that day August is, first, is Eden, and she was a green parrot, and she reminded us that green is the color of creation. And would you all please join August as he leads day one's memory verse. In the beginning, God God created created the heavens and the earth. earth. Genesis 1-1. Perfect. All right, day two, we had another Bible buddy, and he was a poison dart frog, and his name was Tox. Tox. And, yes, Tox. Tox. And it's because... We had sin come in the world. The sin is the black part of the frog. And we also talked about, so we talked about corruption. And we talked about, we talked about corruption and catastrophe. What was the catastrophe that happened on day two, guys? Just say it. The catastrophe. No, corruption. And then what was the catastrophe? The water, the flood. Right. Very good. Very good. And Savannah is going to read our verse. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Psalm 14, 3. Good. On day three, so we had creation, corruption, catastrophe. On day three, we talked about confusion. And boys and girls, what was the Bible story about? That tower. What was the name of that tower? Just... Babel, the Tower of Babel. Scatter was our character of the day because scatter um, is a silver-backed gorilla and the color of the day was kind of gray because of the fog that people were in because they didn't understand each other. And Sophie's going to read this scripture. Please join her. Therefore, Therefore, its its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Genesis 11, 9. Very good. Then on day four, we talked about Christ, and we talked about the cross. And our creature for the day was Rose, and she was a what? Pink river dolphin. Yes, pink river dolphin. And the colors we talked about this day were pink because when you take white from the purity of Christ and you take red from the cross, from the blood that he shed on the cross, then you come up with pink. Can you read the scripture? Off the screen. We don't want to be Okay. And everybody join in with Cambry, please. But, but to, to all who did receive him, him who believed in his name, He He gave the right right to to become become children children of of God. God. John 1, 12. Very nice. All right. Then that brought us to day five, where we talked about consummation. And we talked about how we are going to live forever in heaven. And Bliss is the butterfly who made a metamorphosis from a caterpillar into a butterfly, right? And will you read the scripture? He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Revelation 12, 4. All right. So we are going to sing a couple of songs for you. I was supposed to sing one at the beginning, and I didn't. So we're going to sing the theme verse song first. And we're, so we're going to sing King of the Ages. All right? Here we go. 
the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God. Be honored glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. Honor and glory forever and ever and ever. Amen. everyone. 
We're going to be singing a hymn today, O oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. I uh, wanted to give you a little background on this hymn because I just think it's amazing that songs can be around for hundreds of years and, and still be very meaningful today as they were when they wrote them. So uh, Charles Wesley is one of the greatest hymn writers and he wrote over 6,000 hymns. One of those several thousand hymns that he wrote was O For A Thousand Tongues To Sing. And it was specifically written by him in 1739 to celebrate the first anniversary of his conversion. He wanted to celebrate each of his spiritual birthdays by writing a hymn of praise, and this one seems to have performed well. The original poem consisted of 18 stanzas. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm glad we're not singing 18 stanzas, but that's what are in there. But most hymnals only use some, such as stanzas 7 through 12. Wesley, as far as is known, gleaned the title of this text from Peter Boner, Bowler, who was a Moravian, and said to Wesley, Had I a thousand tongues, I would praise God with them all. So let's use our tongues that we have and praise him by this song now. Please join me, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. <laughs> Good morning again. Let's lift our voice in song.
opportunity to worship together and Lord we just pray over pastor today that his words will just touch each person in the way that they need to be touched today in your precious name we pray amen Matthew 5 1 through 10 now seeing the crowds he went up on a mountain and he began speaking and taught them saying blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Good morning. It's been a great week, a busy week. Um, and the Olympics have started, right? Uh, so do you know why Cinderella cannot win in the Olympics? There's two reasons. First of all, her coach is a pumpkin, and she runs away from the ball. Okay, that probably wasn't even a bronze, was it? Uh, we are working our way through the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we are in the Beatitudes, and uh, we have come up to verse 8 in our study, which is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Uh, the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus teaching about the kingdom of God. Uh, he starts with the poor in spirit, for they will inherit the kingdom of God. He ends with those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for they, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, he, he sandwiches all of those, and ultimately the entire sermon, beyond the Beatitudes, uh, through the following chapters, are about God's kingdom. Jesus came to establish God's kingdom on earth. And for us to, uh, to, to understand that, really the Beatitudes uh, are characteristics of the citizens of the kingdom. He's describing what it is to be a follower of his and a part of God's kingdom. And for, to, to help us think about blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, I want to take us back to the Old Testament to actually a, uh, a benediction that Moses was given by God to tell Aaron to pronounce upon the people of Israel. It's a pretty famous benediction that, that's a blessing that was said over and over again upon the people of God, and it's still a blessing that applies to people today. It's from Numbers chapter 6, and it says, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. This uh, well-known benediction is such because it's really the pinnacle of human uh, experience, uh, human expression to uh, have God's face upon you, to be in the presence of God and for God to give you uh, peace. Um, let me illustrate. Um, if you've been blessed in this life, maybe you've experienced this, where you, uh, you are working a job, you are doing a particular task, and while you're doing that, you just sense, I was made for this. This is, this is what I, I, I was meant to do. Or perhaps you've been blessed to be in a relationship with a person, and when you're with that person, you feel most at home. You feel like, uh, I, I'm, just, I'm just, I'm complete and I am myself with this person. Um, do you follow me? I, have, have you had that kind of experience? I, I want to tell you, if you've been blessed to have those experiences on, on any kind of level, that is just, that is the tip of the iceberg of what it means to be in the presence of God. Because you and I will never feel or know about completion and fulfillment like when we're face to face with God. And God pronounces that blessing upon his people because that's his goal for us is that we would ultimately be with him. Uh, when I think about this kind of thing, I always go back actually to an Olympic account. Uh, 1924, Eric Little ran uh, for Scotland. If you're familiar with him, he, uh, he was born of missionary children in China, uh, represented his country of Scotland and uh, ran. And if you saw the movie Chariots of Fire, uh, you'll remember this account where his sister was asking him, why do you run? 
Um, he, 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 was, he was gifted to communicate the gospel. And she's just like, why do you run? Why, why do you do that? And, and his response was this. He said, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. It wasn't about a medal. It was about doing something that God made him to do. And he felt the pleasure of God, the glory of God uh, in that, that act. Um, and so when Jesus pronounces, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, he's pronouncing a blessing ultimately of God's goal for each of us that we might be in his presence. I've been blessed as a pastor to, uh, to be with people in their last days over and over and over again. And here's one thing that I find uh, that, that kind of ties all those stories together. I hear over and over again from believers, I want to go home. I want to go home. They're talking about heaven. They're talking about being with Jesus. But isn't it interesting? I find it fascinating that people say, I want to go home. And they're talking about a place that they've never been, right? And what makes it home? Jesus. And they already have that connection with him. And because he's there, they want to be there and be with him face to face. And that's Jesus' pronouncement of this blessing. So he says, blessed are the pure in heart. In other words, this is what you need to see God. So what is the biblical concept of the heart. Uh, what, what, what does the Bible teach us about the heart? Because the heart in our culture is very different from the biblical concept of the heart. Because we tend to think of the heart as Valentine's Day, right? Uh, it's about emotion. It's about romance. Uh, we, uh, uh, some people say, the heart wants what the heart wants. And it's, it's emotion driven. But the biblical concept of the heart is the heart is the totality of the inner person. It's the totality of the inner person. Uh, that means it's kind of like the cockpit uh, of your life or the motherboard of your computer. Um, it's, it's the one that directs uh, everything from within. Jesus said, uh, out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false uh, testimony, slander. He's saying, out of the heart thoughts, but then he names actions, right? Um, it's because that's the, the heart is the, the, really the foundation of that. Um, the heart is the fountain of your thoughts and your feelings and your will. Sorry, those who are running the screen, it got out of order. Um, unfortunately, our culture has shifted drastically uh, because there was a time in which I think as a culture, we understood that everybody was morally responsible for their actions. That uh, we make choices and decisions about what we're doing and, um, and then there are consequences to those decisions, good or bad. And there has been a tremendous shift from moral accountability to you just blame everybody else. It's my parents' fault, it's uh, society's fault, it's, it's, and don't take accountability. And ultimately, the good or the bad the Bible communicates comes from within us. Uh, and it, it, it bleeds out, it pours out uh, from, from our lives. And so it's vital that we uh, understand that we, we have a heart issue, a heart problem. Uh, Frank uh, Outlaw, the late president of Bilo Stores, wrote this, and I should have put it on this, the screen so you would have it. But it's a great little poem, and he simply says, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. 
Watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. That's good, isn't it? It all, all, it all starts internally, and then it moves progressively. And so uh, the scriptures actually admonish us to, uh, uh, in 2 Corinthians, it's not in your outline, in 2 Corinthians 10.5, it says, we demolish arguments in every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. In other words, uh, Paul is describing a battle. He's using war terminology to take captive thoughts. He's describing the battle happens within us, and it's going on all the time. And we, we are accountable for our heart condition. So what is the problem with our heart? Now, I'll just say this up front. Uh, we've had a week of working with kids, and kids are so fun. And, and um, you know, I, I, I think when you ask kids questions, I love this classic that I, I remember uh, hearing one time. A Sunday school teacher was talking in Sunday school class, and she said, now, what uh, lives in a tree, collects nuts, and has a big fluffy tail? To which one kid said, it sure sounds like a squirrel, but the answer must be Jesus. <laughs> you know, you're in Sunday school. The answer is always Jesus, right? And I think uh, uh, the, uh, the, when it's a positive answer, it's supposed to be Jesus. And when we're in church and it's a negative answer, we always just go, well, it must be sin, right? Sin or the devil. But what, what is the problem with our heart? Yes, it is sin, but the Bible is real specific, actually. It specifies what kind of sin or problem that we have with our heart. And that is, the problem with our heart is idolatry. Idolatry. Um, and this is the reason why. God made you and me to be worshipers. It, 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 we are hardwired to worship. And you will either worship the one true living God or you will worship someone or something else. But you will worship nonetheless. I mean, it wasn't called American Idol for nothing. The, 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 we, we, we worship sports figures, don't we? We, we, we worship leaders. Uh, we worship the accumulation of things. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying all of you, um, but that's what happens if our heart is off, if we're not uh, uh, having a, a pure heart, a heart that's oriented toward God. Idolatry is anything that takes the place of God. So it's not just bowing down to a golden calf. It's not fashioning an idol out of wood or stone. It can be a good thing that you put in God's place. I'm pausing to allow that to sink in a minute. It can be a good thing that you allow to take God's place. A relationship, a job, status, you name it. It, it. They can be good things. But if they take God's place, then your heart will be veered off. Solomon, one of the wisest men that ever lived. Uh, you read the scriptures he's described as, as exceedingly wise. He was both exceedingly wise and very dumb. He, he, he did not follow God's directives. And what did God had told him? Not to marry women from these other countries. And what does he do? He makes political alliances and he marries from these other nations, which brought in idolatry. And what happened to Solomon and what happened to the nation was his heart became divided between devotion to the one true God and making these wives happy and allowing them to bring in worship of false gods, idolatry. Um, David, 
in Psalm 23, uh, asks an important question. He says, who can ascend to the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? I'll stop there for a moment. He's actually, he, he's actually asking the question that Jesus is saying in this beatitude. He's saying, who can see God? Who can come into God's presence? Who has the right to uh, go upon that holy mountain and uh, stand uh, uh, in the holy place? And he says, the one who, we sang about it, the one who has clean hands and a pure heart. What does that mean? How can I have clean hands and a pure heart? He says, who does not trust in an idol or swear by a false god. This isn't, this isn't perfectionism, people. We're not all immediately wiped out because we are not perfect. That's not what this pure heart is about in this text. The pure heart is about not having idols, not having other allegiances other than the Lord, to put him first. As Jesus says later in this sermon, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these other things will be added. And so we put him first. And, and the scriptures are, are plentiful with uh, telling us and warning us against idolatry. In Ezekiel chapter 36, God speaks to his people and he claims and declares what he'll do. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from all your idols. That's what God's goal is, is to have us rightly related to him in such a manner that then our lives are naturally blessed because we're in relationship with the one who loves us best, knows us best, and has the best for us. In Hebrews 9, uh, 14, it says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What's that dead works about? What, what can he cleanse us from? Any of the works that are for the idols. Any of the works that are for our own glory, any of the works that, that lead our hearts astray from the one true living God. Uh, God desires our hearts. He wants to capture our hearts. Um, is that not what a love relationship is about, right? To uh, give your heart to another. And so what's God's solution for our heart? Uh, what does God propose for, for um, how we can deal with this dividedness that happens within all of us. God's solution to our heart problem is a new heart. It's not, it's not bypass. It's not a pacemaker. It's a complete heart replacement. Now, in the medical terminology, that's very severe, right? And I think it's good that we understand that in the medical terminology because ultimately it's really severe in the spiritual context as well. It's equivalent to Jesus saying to Nicodemus, you got to be born again. You need a restart. You need a new life. You need a new heart. You need a heart that's transformed and changed by the living God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Um, again, from Ezekiel, uh, the, the prophet declares uh, that God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Here's our heart condition, people. I read this many, many years ago. This was before uh, uh, car seats and all that uh, stuff that we have in our vehicles. Uh, a mom was driving her two-year-old in the back seat. You know, we talk about the terrible twos uh, where they, they start uh, wanting to declare some independence. 
her little daughter had unbuckled herself from the seat belt and was standing up in the back seat. To which the mother, looking in the back seat, said, you will sit down and you will buckle yourself in. To which the little girl defiantly said, I will not. And she said, you will. I will not. This went on for a little bit. She said, if you do not, I am going to pull this car over. I am going to spank you. And then I am going to buckle you in that seat. And you are going to stay in that seat belt. To which the little girl realized mom is really serious. And so she sat down and she buckled herself in. And then she announced, I am sitting down on the outside, but I am standing up on the inside. From a two-year-old, people, that is a heart of stone, okay? That is a heart that says, I will only do this because I have to. Not out of the joy and the delight of, I get to do this to honor God and please him. See the difference? You can have, you can have similar appearance of actions outwardly, but the heart is what... God sees. And the heart is what God delights in. Uh, that our heart is changed. And so he says, I know you have a problem. And I'm merciful and gracious. So I'm going to give you a brand new heart and a new spirit so that actually your desire will be to please me, to honor me, to glorify me. The Apostle Paul puts it like this. Um, in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, 17, he says, therefore, anyone who is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Uh, the last uh, day of vacation Bible school, bliss, the, uh, the, the butterfly was the theme animal. Um, actually, uh, in this uh, verse uh, about this transformation in Greek, it's where we get our word met metamorphosis. Now, here is the problem, people. Many of us approach God, and we think we just need tweaked a little bit. We just need a few little modifications, and we'll be fine. And I want to tell you that God is not interested in making sleek, faster caterpillars. He wants to make butterflies. He, 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 he wants to create something even greater and better and not bound to crawl around, but to fly. And that's the work of Christ in our lives. That's the work of the Holy Spirit in a change in our hearts. So the question for all of us is, how do you know you have a new heart? How do you know you have a new heart? Um, and I'm just going to ask us a few, few questions to kind of help us analyze things a little bit. First of all, is your faith only intellectual? Is it about uh, studying? The scriptures tell us that we're to study and, and sh show that we're, 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 well, we're well trained. I, we, we should know the scriptures. But is, is it just an intellectual process for us? I mean, the goal, Jesus' goal for you and me is not that we can win Bible trivia. Not, not that we know all of the stuff and connect all of the dots. If it's only intellectual, we're missing part of the heart, right? The Pharisees knew the Old Testament backward and forward. They knew the Bible but they were so blind they did not see the Son of God when he was standing right before them. They, they knew the letter of the law, but they did not know the spirit of the law. Is your faith only emotional? Is it only about what, what moves you emotionally? I believe we're uh, experiencing a time in the United States in which, uh, sadly, I think people run from church to church based upon emotion. 
people will analyze a worship service and go, did I feel something? Now, let me say this. If you go to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday and you don't feel anything, you need to check. But it's probably yourself, okay? Because there's an issue there. But it should not all be about emotion either. Because if it's about manipulating people's emotions, that's not worship either. But God should pull us. Our hearts should be tugged. We should weep sometimes over sin, which is a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, right? There are times in which we should be filled with joy. I mean, to watch these kids this morning sing about our king, who's immortal, invisible, the only wise God. I mean, should, should you not be filled with joy, right? There, there, are, there are things that, yes, should move us. But is it just about emotion? Then you got you to gotta question. Or is it just about, only about volitional? Is it, is it only about the will? Is it only about doing things? I can tell you as a pastor, I, I have witnessed some of the most joyless people who do everything right. But when you talk to them, it's like duty. It's like, it's like I got to do this for God. But you don't get any sense of, I get to do this for God. I got to do this for God. And is that what it's about so that we please him and get his acceptance? If it is, we're still missing something. See, see, when Jesus uh, talks about our heart, he's talking about a new heart that's completely changed us from the inside out. So it involves our intellect. It involves our emotions. It involves our will. It, it, it encompasses all of us. So that it's the whole picture. It's not, it's not dissected. Because he wants all of us. And he and he alone brings that about. Now I don't know where Susan is sitting. Uh, it's almost, there she is in the back. It's almost as if she knew uh, exactly where I was going. She, she introduced uh, the, the, the opening hymn. And the conclusion to this sermon is to introduce basically the closing hymn. Um, in, in her book entitled, Her Heart Can Sing, The Life and Hymns of Fanny Crosby, Edith uh, Blumhofer uh, describes Fanny's life and her faith. Now, I don't know if you know anything about Fanny Crosby, but Fanny Crosby, um, through uh, the, the, the neglect of a physician, uh, lost her sight as an infant. And uh, she, she was an amazing hymn writer. She wrote over 9,000 hymns. Um, and, and she had, God gave her a brilliant mind. Uh, in reading about it, uh, it said that Fanny kept two secretaries and she could simultaneously dictate two hymns at the same time. She would dictate one line of a hymn one secretary, and she had to have, the, have these secretaries to write everything down, and she would then give the, the next line to the other secretary over here, pick up the next line of this hymn, and then go on to this hymn, and back and forth, and she kept them all busy. And she, uh, she's probably most famously known for um, Blessed Assurance, uh, and, um, and Near to the Cross, she, let me see. Uh, Jesus, keep me near the cross, and I am thine, O Lord. Uh, but there are ones that you've probably never even seen in your hymnal, but 9,000 from one person. She was also very dedicated to going to the Manhattan um, homeless shelters to minister and care for uh, the, the downtrodden. And she was always challenging her fellow Christians to serve the Lord. And this was the hook. This was the line that she always used. Because one day we're going to see Jesus. 
And so we need to do all we can because one day we're going to see Jesus. And my favorite, favorite quote uh, from uh, Fanny Crosby is this. If I had the choice, I would still choose to remain blind. For when I die, the first face I will ever see will be the face of my blessed Savior. Wow. Wow. That's what she was living for. That's what she was looking forward to. People, that's a pure heart. A heart that's not divided. Does Jesus have all of your loyalty? Are you looking to honor him first and foremost? Or are there other things that are sitting on the throne of your heart that are controlling the strings, that are pulling at you? Surrender it. Give it to him. You will never be as fulfilled as when you are fully committed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Lord, thank you that you are a loving, relational God who desires to have every single one of us see you face to face, to be with you, to, as the children read, um, to experience that you will wipe away every tear and that there will be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more sickness, no more death, for the old order of things has passed away, and behold, you make all things new. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing your kingdom here to earth, for starting the kingdom work, and we thank you, Lord, that every time we surrender to you, your kingdom grows. It grows in our hearts, and it grows as we reach other people in your son's name. And so, Lord, I pray. I pray for the one here this morning who has not yet trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I pray that today might be the day that they just ask, Jesus, please forgive me of my sins and come into my life. I surrender myself to you. I want to have that new heart. I want to have your spirit within me. I want to be yours. And for my brothers and sisters who have that but may be struggling with some idol worship, Lord, may we cast them down. May we lay them at your feet. May we confess them and repent from them and turn from them. knowing that you always have better than the temporal things that this world can offer and entice us with. And ultimately, Lord, may we all be ready so that without a doubt, the moment we breathe our last, we go home to be with you we pray in the mighty name of Jesus who gave his life for us and all God's people said, amen, amen. Now as we sing this uh, glorious hymn, Blessed Assurance, uh, the altar is open and available for any and all. If you, uh, if you need prayer, if you uh, prayed and asked the Lord Jesus Christ to come into your life, he tells us if we need to profess it before men that he might confess us before the Father. Uh, confirm that decision. If you want to rededicate your life, if God is prompting you to join this church family for any reason, uh, feel free to come. There are counselors available and will remain available even after the service to talk and pray with you. Let's stand and sing together. Blessed assurance. <laughs> Thank you for watching Joy for the Journey, a presentation of worship from the First Baptist Church of Mattoon, Illinois. To learn more about the ministries of our church, learn how you can join us in worship, or to support this television ministry, 
contact us at 1804 South 9th Street, Mattoon, Illinois, 61938. You can also visit us at our website, www.fbcmattoon.org. First Baptist Church, a family for everyone.